what you have seen on the LSU side of the equation is consistent improvement in the areas in which you must improve, right? Like week to week, there's been a very clear process where LSU has a problem um, that the film shows that a game reveals, right? And they spend the week addressing that problem, whether it's like moving Jack Besh back to return punts, tinkering with that O-line until they figured it out, and Harold Perkins more involved defensively, along with Savion Jones, a lot of other guys that we could talk about here. Uh, this is a team that appears to be getting better and better. And look, Saturday, as Jake told you, the New Mexico team is not awful. They are not Southern, and, and that's not a shot at Southern. It's just from a, a program standpoint, that's just where they, 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 they are right now. And so 38 nothing. you may be like, okay, whatever. But then you look a bit deeper, dude, 633 yards to 88. <laughs> Um, eight yards per play, which is beyond elite to 2.7, 28 first downs to two, two. Um, it was a true dominant performance. And I don't care what level of competition you are playing. We're going to judge you, uh, based on what you do. Like you can't control who the opponent is. And on this night, um, there are a few things that LSU could have done better. So it was, uh, I thought it was all very encouraging to see. Yeah, I'm with you. And how many times have we sat here and we talked on a microphone about a game where LSU should have done exactly what they did yeah. on Saturday and they didn't. And it didn't look right. And it and it just looked off. And, I mean, you can go to, it feels like every time that you play an in-state opponent. I mean, ULM last year, T, I mean, you and I have played in games like this. I mean, I know we played App State like in 05 and it was 21 to nothing. It just, it didn't feel great. We played Troy in 04 kind of the same way. And I can point to, it feels like hundreds of games in LSU football history, but this team and this staff, they've done a really nice job of when they're supposed to take care of business. They not only do so, but they do it in in a way where you feel better leaving the game. And it's hard to feel better leaving a game like this typically. Yes, I agree. And so you go out there and you do dominate. I mean, two first downs, less than 100 yards. Uh, New Mexico was one of 10 on third down. On, on the money downs for you, third and fourth down, you were nine of 16. I mean, you mentioned it, over 600 yards of offense. And they worked on some things that they needed to work on. Like, we talked, I don't know if we were talking on air or off air last week, but we were talking about, you know, back when, when you and I were playing, like, Special teams, It's you look up and the left tackle on punt is All-American Craig Stelf. I, I, I was playing right guards and starting yeah. running back on on um, extra points and field goals. Like, I was the wing and Dixon was the other wing. And you just you, you found spots for guys that could go out there and get the job done. You didn't really care what they were doing on offense or defense. And, like, even, like, a Jack Besh, we were talking about, hey, he's a big dude. Like, if he's not going to play on offense, now he did in this game, hey, put him back there at returner. Put him da- down there to cover kicks or whatever – it might be so. You yep, even saw, saw some that. of the personnel, like small little changes, where you're having, you know, some some different bodies in there on the special teams because I think you need that. I think, I mean, look, Devin White was like a core four special teams guy when he was an All American, and I realize you can be like, well, you don't want to get him hurt. No, no, that's not it. I mean, look, that's part of the game. You got to go out there and you got to play. It's you got to find the guys that want to go out there and want to do it. So even like I took that away from this game is I like some of the small personnel changes. It was complete dominance and. They're starting to figure it out. This team was learning each other in week one. We saw that in the Florida State game. Yeah. You continue week by week to figure each other out, to learn each other, to figure out what you can do from a coaching perspective and what you can do from a player perspective. It feels like every single time they go out there, they're getting just slightly better, yeah. and which is what, that's what you want with a new staff. And really, especially on that. Well, and I don't want to say especially. Uh, I just think coming out of this game, the defensive side of the ball seems so exciting. I mean, this is a defense that lays the wood, dude. Greg Brooks hits. Everybody on this defense hits. But it's a defense that, as we said last game, I felt like it was the first time in a long time where I felt like LSU really bullied someone into submission. It looked like they carried that forward. And it looks like next week you got someone who is very bulliable. Uh, We'll talk more LSU-Auburn coming up a bit later in the show. So these are all kind of very... You know, big picture takeaways from Saturday night. We'll get into some of the nitty gritty next here on OTV. Other big takeaways from this game. Uh, I love the fact that we, we talk about learning the groups. Offense came out, tempo, tempo, tempo. It looks like they've, uh, I think they were doing this on Saturday. The film rewatch will discover more. But it looked like they had, they had a sound strategy sometimes. It was like, okay, if we get the first first down, then we will transition into tempo. 
And, uh, and that makes sense given that it allows the defense to rest, right? You avoid, like, what's the, 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 the problem that we talk about if you're just full tempo all the time is yeah. going out there, going three and out, and giving the defense basically 15 seconds to catch their breath. This kind of combats yeah. that while putting the defense on the back heel if you already get a nice first down. So I like that from a strategy standpoint from Den Brock. Um, he continues to feel to get more comfortable with what Jaden Daniels is comfortable in. I mean, it's a hell of a stat line for Daniels. 24-29, 279. He was already completing 70% of his passes coming into this game. Actually, I need to, I need to do a stat check on Jaden Daniels on the year right now. Um, but he was fantastic. And then uh, he goes down with what I thought live looked like a head thing because like his head bounced off that turf. Um, reportedly, they're saying he's getting his lower back checked out. We'll update that situation as we know more. But um, he was fantastic. He goes down. And then Garrett Nussmeyer came in, and he played great. And he looked like a player that is maybe more somebody who has kind of accepted what his role on the team is. dude. And he didn't feel like the player pushing, trying to prove that, no, I should still be. He just... He just looked like he went out there and was much more composed than he was the last time we saw him. He did, and the last time we saw him, obviously, like it, it had just happened where he was not going to be the starter, and you're pressing, yeah. and you're like, man, I'm, I'm playing a team. I feel like I, I can go out there and make plays, and he just was not himself. I mean, he was like, ah, there's like an LSU guy somewhere down there. We're just throwing it up, yeah. and you didn't get that this time, and you saw why it was a close competition, and you saw why uh, you know, he's going to be the starter in, at LSU if he stays the course here because he has that kind of talent at some point in his career. And it was good for him to get in there, and it was good for him to get that confidence back because there might be a point where you need him yeah. this year. When your quarterback runs as he much runs. as Daniels does, there might be a hit. I mean, there was, there was a hit in this game, right? Yeah. Now, he said, Coach said he could come back if he had to, if the game – was a little bit different, but that's just what's going to happen. When you have a quarterback like that, we know it. It's going to happen at some point this year, even if it's for a handful of plays. So it was good for him, and it was good for the team for him to get in there, get that confidence back, the reason that he pushed Jaden Daniels to the very wire of the starting quarterback competition. I agree. And so Nussin's up 9-10 for 130 touchdown, had that beautiful 50-plus uh, yard touchdown to uh, Hilton. By the way, Daniels right now completing 73% of his passes – um, six touchdowns, no picks. So, uh, as, as we start to break down Auburn this week, you're going to realize just how happy you should be with what you've gotten out of Jaden how, Daniels. He looks like the thing that I've noticed about Daniels watching the tape is he doesn't panic ever. And that's hard for a quarterback that runs as much as he does not yeah. to panic. But even when he leaves the pocket, there's a smoothness to it. And that's hard to find. And I think I that's one of his biggest strengths is how he doesn't panic and tries to play within the offense. And could we sit here and we could go watch tape and we could be like, ah, oh, man, I wish you would have thrown that one. I wish you would have. Even doing that last week, though, with Flynn, like even times like sitting in the stands, just initially watching, I'm like, oh, man, I wish he would have maybe delivered mm -hmm. that football. You go back and it's like, well, no, that's actually the coverage dictates that he shouldn't be looking at that side. And that's why he ran. I'm like, okay. all right, when you do a deep dive into it, there's a lot of uh, reasoning why he's doing what he's doing. Well, and the, and, and, and the coaches have talked about that, right? There's certainly, like, early, uh, like, read recognition, understanding what the defense is in. These are things that remain a work in progress. But, I mean, really, that's not saying much. They remain a work in progress for every quarterback in the country. Uh, but certainly, Daniel seems to be getting better each and every game. And I love the wide receiver production spread here, Jake. Now, I know it's a bit extreme. Because you gained a lot more yards than you will against a more competitive defense. And so this is not the, – the, the volume of these numbers are not going to be uh, what they are in this game, in the SEC games. But the kind of spread can be. And it can carry over. And to me, it highlights the strength of this LSU team, which is a wide receiver group, right? You have Brian Thomas Jr. And I think I said Hilton on the 50-yard touchdown. Excuse me. Hilton could have had – about an 80-yard touchdown if Daniels had led him a little more there early on. He has the one catch for 51. But Brian Thomas Jr. leads away, three catches, 76 with a tud. Uh, and I, I love Brian Thomas, by the way, dude. Every time he touches the ball, Jake, the first person never gets him down. Like, his ability yeah. to create after the catch is fantastic. So he has three catches, 76. Malik Neighbors, six or 65, which you know he's going to do that. Then Dre Jenkins, you know what he's going to do, five. Yep. 
for 57, Besh, six for 43. They made a concerted effort. They did. You get best the ball more. And, and look, I think he played the most offensive snaps of the receivers. Really? Yeah. And 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 here's where, you know, this is where you you get a bit more into, okay, this was a game where uh, you rotate a lot of guys in, but Kyron Lace with four catches, Mason Taylor, who they really continue to like and want to develop with four catches. Uh, Cole Taylor had one. He also had the touchdown guy got called back. Josh Williams with a couple. So the point is, like, you are not going to have your – uh, like Jeff, Justin Jefferson, twenty eighteen, or mm, well, you're you're not gonna have one guy with all the yards. Like this sort of spread, I think, is what this offense needs if it's going to be successful. Then how? What more can you say defensively about Harold Perkins? What's he played in? Uh, who tweeted this? Maybe it was Shea. I, I apologize if I'm uh, wrongly attributing the tweet, but somebody's like Harold Perkins has played in four career college games. He's led his team in tackles in two of them. I think it was Shea. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, he's fantastic. Yeah, he is, Harold and Shea. He is everything that he was advertised to be coming out of high school. And the coaches remember he didn't get here early, right? He didn't get here in the spring, and so the coaches oh, weird. they had a chance to see him for the first time in the summer. Like, uh, yeah, you're playing. <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna be out there. And I mean, Matt House told me that like second or third day of training camp, he's like, we we're gonna have to find a spot for him eventually. Well, that eventually happened uh, pretty quickly here. In the season. So, yeah, there's there's a lot of things. We could sit here and we could wax poetically about the defense. I don't care who your opponent is. When you have four sacks and the quarterback for the other team attempted seven passes. He attempted seven passes. Oh, wow. And you had four sacks. And you had four sacks. Oh, okay. <laughs> like, I mean, what, are we gonna, what else can we say about what you did defensively? Oh, and T-Bob gave you less than 100 yards, a couple of first downs, one third down conversion. I mean, the game plan the last couple of weeks for Matt House has been – Fantastic. But another thing that we spent a lot of time here on this show talking about is pass protection. And you're starting to see some guys figure it out a little bit. In 41 uh, pass plays, Will Campbell graded out at 88%. Yeah. In 41 pass plays, Garrett Dellinger graded out at 86%. Yeah. In 26 pass plays, Miles Frazier, who has been struggling a mm -hmm. little bit, graded out at 84%. What did Richardson do? You had oh, Anthony... Anthony Bradford had... Oh, so why, why did I call me Anthony Bradford? I know what you meant. What am I, yeah. Who's You're Florida Richardson? quarterback. Oh, okay. I, hey, I know what you meant. <laughs> that, I was just going to keep going. That's how you know we were really on the same page there. Yeah, thank you for listening uh, to Anthony Bradford. Uh, 21 pass plays. He grayed out 83%. Okay. Um, Emory Jones, 44 pass plays, 67%. But again, playing a position... I mean, I'm still shocked at how good he played last week. Me so too. Like, I'll, I'll allow room for growth there. So because... Charles Turner was the only one that had a... A poor grade. He had 55% on 44 huh. pass plays. Be interested in diving that film tonight. Yeah, me See too, because was he was the only one that didn't have a passing grade. So that's a good sign. And also your backups that came in now wasn't as many plays, but they did, you know, they did good. Uh, you had Thomas Hill, Martinez, Shorts, all kind of in very limited snaps, took care of business. So that group is a group that we've probably worried about more than any other group. Yep. And you're starting to see, like, Dellinger and Campbell are now habitual 82, 83, 84, 85 percent guys.